Well, that's going around, man. I'm stoked, you guys. I'm stoked if you're here. For those of you guys that don't know what that word means, it just means I'm really excited. So we're really excited that you're here. If this is your first time to the bridge, again, we just want to welcome you. Our heart is not that we're just a church and that we come and sing Christian karaoke and hear a message on Sunday and leave the exact way we came in. Our heart is that we truly are a family, that we build relationships, that we do what it says in Hebrews, that we spur one another on to love and good deeds in Christ. So that when we come, my prayer for you and for me is that we truly leave this place different than when we came in. Amen? I say this all the time too, that every single week we get a chance to open up the Bible together. And that's because we believe that the Bible is all about Jesus. And we believe that Jesus is the greatest person to walk the face of the earth. And more than that, we believe that he's more than just an amazing person, that he is God in the flesh, amen? And so when we get to open up the Bible, this is why it's important. When you and I open up the Bible, whether together or on our own, it is you and I getting the opportunity to gaze into the face of Jesus. You get a chance to gaze into the face of Jesus every single time you open this book. Amen? Um, Here we go. We're going to turn chapter 6 of Joshua. It says, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men and do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. And when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Shout, right? Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. God, we just bless you. God, we thank you for all that you are. I thank you for your word today, Jesus. I ask Holy Spirit, do something that only you can do in our lives. In this moment, God, at this time in history, God, at this point in our lives, Jesus, God, we say yes to you today. God, speak to us. Write your word upon our hearts, God. Ignite a flame in our hearts, Jesus, to say yes to you, God. To say no to fear. To say no to doubt, God. To say no to unbelief, God, to say no to the enemy, Jesus, God, to say no to living a life that is defeated, God. We choose victory in you today, Jesus, God. We ask, speak to us today. May your words be my words. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. This passage is amazing because only God can give you a victory over a battle you haven't even fought yet. We've gone through chapter six, but this is amazing. He says this, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out, no one came in. And then the Lord said to Joshua, see, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. And Joshua's like, see, God, I'm seeing. And it's not lining up with what you're saying. I'm seeing a city that's securely barred. God, so I know you said you've given it to us and it's king and all its fighting men, but God, there's no chance. Am I hearing you wrong? And I think for us, Joshua heard God's voice. He heard him say that I've delivered Jericho into your hands. But what Joshua saw, what do we do in our lives when what we see doesn't line up with what he says? We have a choice. We have a choice to either believe him on his word and stand on, I say it all the time, that we need to be a people who stand on what we know is true rather than how we feel, even sometimes rather than just what we see. We have to stand on his word. Joshua heard him speak. And there are gonna be seasons and moments in our lives when God speaks to you about what you're facing or what you're even about to face. And it isn't gonna line up with what you see. It's in front of you. And in that moment, we have to, to stand on what we know is true. We have to stand in faith, amen? But in order to stand on hearing his voice and stand on his faith, you have to know what he says. And I think if we're honest, too many of us, we know about him, but we honestly don't know him. We don't spend time listening. We spend time going to him when things are going wrong. God, 
Help me, help fix this in my life. God, fix my marriage, fix my children. God, help me, give me a job. God, do this, do that. But we don't spend time listening. As we've been studying, Joshua says early in the morning, Joshua got up. We talked about last week making him priority and setting your eyes on him before you set your eyes on any other man. We have to know what he says. And then when we know what he says, when we read it, it's still a choice. We're not Pinocchio, right? We still have to choose to believe it and to take possession of it. So I want to challenge you today. There's what is in your life. Not only hear this, but take it to heart. God, what in my life right now? Have you spoken to me and the things that I'm seeing don't line up with that? Show me, God, where I am living defeated in fear because I'm not standing in confidence and boldness. I'm not being strong and courageous and standing on what you say, on who you say that I am. Because what I see is not lining up with what you say. I pray that you and I choose to stand on what we hear, on what we know he says, on his promises over our lives. Because I promise you, when you do that, you will not be shaken, amen? You won't live defeated in fear. You know that he's for us. If he's for you, who can be against you? You know that he's going before you. And you can stand confident knowing, God, I know. Man, everything is falling apart, Jesus. But I know what you've spoken to me. Even for me and Katie, for those of you guys that know our story, I mean, the Lord spoke almost a year before we got married to Katie. She walked in the back door and she heard the Lord just say, this is my perfect will for your life. I was engaged at the time. She's not a home wrecker, don't worry. Uh, I was engaged at the time. Um, and... We were going through premarital, and they met with me. They met with the girls engaged to, and then they met with us, and they said, hey, let's pray. I said, all right, that's normal. You know, and then they said, hey, normally we don't break up people. It's like, that's a, I'm a joker, so I'm like, that's a great way to start a marriage, right? But they were serious, you know, and they were like, Justin, you very much have a lot of doubt still. And to the girl I was with, she just, they just said, you see Justin as a father figure in your life, and eventually that's not going to work. So props to them for saying that. And thank God I listened because she was truly God's best for me in my life. Like You guys know, if you're close to me, Katie's my best friend. I always tell my buddies, don't get offended if I choose to hang out with her over anybody else. Because I, I do, I love hanging with her. Whether that's taking a nap, whether that's just laughing, whether that's taking a walk, whether that's going to Disneyland without her children, like whatever. Like I enjoy spending time with her. She's my best friend. And I remember breaking up and all that stuff going on. All of a sudden, I found myself on a plane to England leading worship for a conference with her family. And she was already over there praying every single day for months upon months, standing on what God had spoken to her. And as soon as I got off the plane, I, like, couldn't sleep. I was like, God, why am I so stoked to, like, meet this chick? I'm so excited for like what you're going to do right now. And I heard the Lord say vocally, and I've always, been, I've always been blessed to hear that in my life. I heard the Lord say, this is the wife I've given you, cherish her. And I was like, sign me up. <laughs> that was my initial thought. And then my next thought was like, oh, crap. I've made a lot of mistakes. Like, I, she's a PK. I don't know. Whew. God, you got to do this for sure. But if you can speak through a donkey, you can do this, right? You can make it happen. And what are we, almost 15 years? And every time we've gone through some hard stuff in our marriage, we've always gone back to, dude, we're standing on what God said. And we always grow closer and closer and closer. I love her more now than I ever did. We were joking last year, we shot a wedding in Hawaii. And as we're floating down the lazy river with no children, it was amazing. Just, just like when you get to that point in your marriage where you could just be silent and super satisfied, like it's amazing. And I remember we were floating down, and we just looked at each other, and we were like, what were we thinking? Like, we did not know anything about each other when we got married. We just knew what God had said. And he had planted a love, like a genuine love inside our hearts for one another that has only grown. And one of the most beautiful things about my wife, even though I think she's amazingly gorgeous and hot and beautiful and sweet and 
a fiery little girl, right? Um, but one of the most attractive things about her to me is the fact that she's passionately in love with Jesus first. And so I know that even if my, I lose my life or something happens to me, I know that she'll still carry on that legacy of being a passionate lover of Jesus with my girls for generations to come. Be people that stand on what you know is true and what he says, not just by what you see. Amen? It's the first thing. We need to stand in faith. The second thing, let's keep reading. Verse 6, it says, So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, Advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. As I read this this week, there were two things that stood out at me. Number one, this is the first time where the ark of the covenant didn't go ahead. Remember when they crossed the Jordan? They said, hey, you must stand behind like a thousand yards of the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the very presence of God in their lives, that you had to wait to see where you would go. The Ark was going to lead the way, but this time, as they're going to come in, what does he say? He says, hey, let the priests go in front of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And in front of them, put the armed guard. That stood out to me. And then the other thing is he didn't, he didn't say, hey, but let's stop and prepare. He said, advance. And that was huge to me this week because I believe for us as a church, for us as a people, just for the kingdom right now, that we're not called to prepare anymore. I feel we sit in complacency saying, God, just do this in my life. Just use me. Just do all this stuff. And we wait for him to do all the work. And God's looking, searching the earth for people that are going to say, God, send me. Use me. And I feel for us as a church, I don't know about you, I feel he's calling us to advance. I'm tired of hearing people diagnosed with cancer. I'm tired of hearing about marriages that are being broken and messed up. I'm tired of hearing about people's lives that are being destroyed. And them walking away from the faith. I'm tired of that. Because this is either the answer or it's not. And we're all wasting our time. But I don't believe we're wasting our time. Amen? Amen. And that's not just because of what I've seen or what I've heard. It's because of who I've seen and who I've heard. And how I've seen a move in my life. Like for you and for me, I pray that we advance. Amen? I pray that today we choose to say, God, I choose to advance. To move forward. It's huge. The definition of advance is this, to move forward in a purposeful way. If we're honest, too many of us, us are living these Christian lives without any purpose. We're just checking the box. Cool, we made it to the party. We're forgiven. God's going to hook us up. All those shirts, Jesus is my homeboy, right? Dude, he's not. He's our God. He's a holy God. That his people didn't even want to say his name because they had so much reverence for him. He's the king of kings, the name above all names. He's our savior, our redeemer, our healer, and he's telling us to live with purpose, to advance with purpose. Amen? To move forward in a purposeful way, to make or cause or to make progress how many of us are living our lives the same place we were last year? I joke about exercise all the time, right? I do. I, I'll be honest. Like, I'm vulnerable with you guys. I pray, God, I think I have an issue with food. I love food too much. I have an addiction to Krispy Kremes. And, like, every time I'm driving by, I feel like there's a homing beacon that's like, beep, beep. And I open my app, and I don't know why, but like 90% of the time, the hot light's on, which tells, like, there's no excuse. It's like, dude, the spirit is falling right there on Vineyard Avenue in Oxnard. And then you go in there, and your life has changed. You know, I remember speaking for youth conferences, and I was talking about the idea that, like, Krispy Kreme and Jesus, like, well, how does it work? He says, taste and see that the Lord is good, that his mercies are new every morning, Right? 
And it's not for like Christmas, but like when you go in and the hot light's flashing, it's, I'm, we're going to get them some week and I'm just going to change your lives. And we're going to bring them in and like, it just melts on your tongue. And my encouragement for people was too many of us know about him, but don't really know him. And when you eat a Krispy Kreme that's hot right out of the deal, it changes your life. <laughs> Keto and Atkins and all that stuff goes out the window because you've been changed, right? And the same is true when you encounter Jesus, when you spend time with Jesus, when you taste and see that his love is good, that his mercies are new every morning. If you and I truly meet with the Savior and the King of Kings, we should be living different. We should be moving from glory to glory in our lives. Our friends, our people in our lives that are close to us should be able to look at our lives and say, you're different than when you were last year. You're more mature, you're growing, and I'm so stoked to see what God's doing in your life. My encouragement for you is let's not sit here next year and be the same. Let's not sit here next week and be the same, amen? We've got to move. We have to advance. And I believe that is the call on our church. I'm so grateful, and I give on, like Fred and Pam, my father-in-law, all the people in this region, the leaders of this region, the generation before me, that got to plow the ground so that I could come, so that we could come, and we can step into the inheritance that God has given to us. But I believe that this is the season and the time for us to do that. I don't want to just hear about it. I don't want to just sow and not reap. I want to see it, amen? I still pray. I was praying with my little girl the other day, and we were praying, and we were asking, saying, just, Daddy, you pray, and then I'll pray what you pray. It was good, and I was praying over, like, God, Jesus, help me always know your voice. Jesus, help me always know your voice. Jesus, help me always be a worshiper of you. Jesus, help me always be a worshiper of you. God, help me to carry your presence everywhere I go. And as she said that over her life, I just felt that anointing. I said, God, I pray, God, allow me to be used by you to heal people, God, that even when they come into my shadows, like it says in your word, that they will be healed. And to hear her little voice, six years old, say that. I believe God hears that, amen? We have to advance. We can't stay still. We can't, Amen? I don't want to just play church with you guys. If we want to play church, we're in the wrong place. And I need to know, because I don't want to play church. I feel like God is calling to raise an army, not just of us, like young and old, but I feel like even our children. I pray that our children will have so much faith that when mom and dad are fighting at home, that our kids will be like, dad, can we just pray? <laughs> can you imagine hearing that? Oh my gosh. No, we were driving, and it's funny, Adley said this today. She's amazing sense of humor. And um, I was just like rubbing Katie's shoulders. I was driving. I was driving safe, but I was just rubbing. And Adley's all, Dad, keep your hands on the wheel, right? <laughs> we just started busting up. Like, but those little ones, like I feel, we were talking with Pam and Fred this week. And they gave us just such wisdom of like, they might be little people, but there is no junior Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. They can still hear his voice. They can still speak. They can still prophesy and change atmospheres. And that's what we're called to do. Amen? When we walk into a room, darkness does have to flee if we're walking right, right? Let's advance. Amen? It's huge. Second Chronicles 16.9 says this, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. That's a promise. John 4, 23 through 24 says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers, those truly devoted to him, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Amen? We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Amen? There's authority that you and I have that we just need to step into. 
First Peter 5, 8, 9 says, Be self-controlled and alert, for your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon that is formed against you will prosper, amen? And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, will, you will condemn. This is the heritage, the inheritance that the servants for the servants of the Lord and their vindiction is from me, declares the Lord. Ephesians 6, 11 through 17, you know this. Put on the full armor of God so that why? You can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That's all they are is schemes. Yet we still let it defeat us. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, continue to stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness, readiness, right, to move, not just to stand still, readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen? I believe this is so significant for us as a church and individually that we have to stand in faith, that we have to advance and move forward, that we have to believe that we truly carry the presence of God in our lives, that we have to advance. Amen? And last, we have to shout. we got to stop being quiet. Amen? We have to shout for the Lord has given us the city. We have to be a people who hope and rejoice and who stand in faith, even when what we see doesn't line up with what he said. Amen? Read through. I think I del deleted my text, but um, as they go around the city on the seventh day, they shout, and the Lord gives them the city. What do you need to stand in faith for in your life right now? Where is that giant of fear or unbelief that's keeping you from being the person that God's called you to be? And take the heavy shoes and chains off. Amen? Take your shoes off if you need to. <laughs> that's from the Holy Spirit. I know that is. Take your shoes off. Stick them in the, glue, in the glue of condemnation and shame and guilt and get out and step in freedom knowing that he's called you to move and advance and take the city, amen? And shout his name to the nations. Shout his name from one generation to the next. Shout his good deeds. Let him use you and do things in your life so there's testimony. So when someone comes to you and they're broken, you have an answer, amen? Amen. And it's not just because of what you've heard, but because you've made history with God. And all along the way, you've seen him part Red Seas. You've seen him provide manna in the wilderness. You've seen him provide water out of a rock. You've seen him continually be faithful and do things in your life that only he can. And the history that you have with him, that you make every single day, that is what causes you and I to be strong and courageous, to not fear, to not be afraid, to not be discouraged, and to take the land that he's given to us. Amen? Amen. That's hope in that. I continue every time I drive up, God, thank you for this city. Not because I want to reign over it. But God, thank you for the city that you were going to use me as a mouthpiece, that you're going to use our body, this thing called the bridge, as a loudspeaker to proclaim your good news, your hope, your restoration, your redemption. God, and that because of that, it's going to go out and touch the globe. I believe that with everything in me. Maybe it's a hoorah speech. I don't know. I don't think so. I believe that we were created for greatness. I believe that we carry the presence of God everywhere we go. I believe we just need to wake up and step into that. Amen? I've got a clip I want to share with you guys, and then we're going to just stand, and we're going to go for it. We're going to make a choice today. Amen? But let's go ahead and watch this together.
we got the news that he was in extremely serious condition, and it just went from worse to worse. In about a 12-hour time period, it, it went from he's just kind of had, had this little sick thing at home to life or death. We were, you know, we were in a, we were in a battle for a child's life and for a family. I'm a little bit of a, um, a nut when it comes to Christmas <laughs> because I didn't have the lights outside and all of that. We grew up, you know, kind of poor, and, and um, so this was a really special Christmas for us. Um, you know, we went out and got our tree, and stockings were hung, and then everything changed. We love to do uh, train cake every year together as a family, and Jackson and I were actually doing that, just me and him that day. So it was a super fun, like, mommy-son moment, and we were making the cake, and then that evening, just not long after that, he was just laid out on the floor. I knew this, he's not okay. He needs to go to the hospital. And so we rushed him to the ER. He was just, like, so sick, and I could hardly, you know, get him to the hospital. The doctor had called me up, and he said, I'm really concerned that he might have E. coli. When I heard that, I thought, oh, psh, that's like one in a million chance. I don't feel like that would be possible. Um, and if it is E. coli, that's treatable. And a lot of times, E. coli doesn't, I mean, it's just a terrible sickness and it passes through the system. But in our case, um, he contracted HUS, that, which then developed into kidney failure and to the most severe, um, the most severe case of HUS. The doctor had said that this is basically out of their realm of capabilities and that we had to go to a different children's hospital. And I was thinking, oh, that's gonna be in the next few days. He said, no, you need to go tonight and you're gonna get on a helicopter, we're gonna fly him there. I was just flooded with the sense that I might never know my boy. Growing up to be a man, it might be this week that I lose my son. All of a sudden, his speech starts to slur. He just started not being able to communicate, not being able to respond. In the middle of the night, they rushed us up to the PQ and called the neurosurgeon in. They tested him, and there was no response. There was no pain response. There was no recognition of me. And at that moment, I thought, I, I'm losing my son. Even if he makes it through this, I don't know if he'll ever know me again. He was just sprawled out on the bed and couldn't respond to anything. He was gone. There's a time when you've said every prayer you can say, and you don't have the strength to praise and worship anymore. And you haven't slept for weeks. And you're just kind of undone. And that was a moment for me when I was undone. The flip side of that is, I feel like that was the moment that I really began to feel the prayers around the world. Hi, it's Christmas morning, and a lot of you are asking how Jackson's doing. And just want to say thanks for all your prayers and support. It's been overwhelming. Um, it's a really long story, but it's really complicated right now, and we really need a Christmas miracle. They can't get to his blood. Um, there was something supernatural that, that happened that brought the church together. I would pull up social media and I would just read people's prayers in the comments of people all over the world. And I've never met them before, but they were just crying out for my son. We were in the brink of life or death and people would be posting comments on our Facebook. We are up praying for you. People posting by the thousands, commenting, and they'd be all over the world. We're in Brazil. My church, whole church is praying for you. I'm in Russia. My little children pray for your son every day. I didn't have any prayers left to say, but I could feel and see and hear the prayers being said on my behalf. Yeah, just 
This is a box full of letters and something that we've really treasured. This is the bed that Jackson is laying on. And Jesus is healing him. They're in the middle of the world. Oh, wow. Jesus. <laughs> From Mercy, four years old. Hooked up to everything. They allowed me just to like hold him in my arms and you could just see the light still in his eyes. And I just remember just standing and declaring over him. He was gonna he was gonna raise up out of that grave and he was gonna he was gonna live. We'd get good news and then worse news. It'd be this, it was so up and down, and so we go to the hospital and they said they thought he'd be okay, so they sent us home. And then to find out that he's worse than you even thought the first time. And then you're at the hospital and you're thinking, you know, he's gonna get better. And then you find yourself in a helicopter. And then you find yourself in a... <sighs> the head of the PICU came in and said, we have to get we have to get a central line in tonight. They couldn't give him another sedative, so it would be like going in, basically having surgery on a child without any anesthesia. And the doctor took us aside and put us in another room. They took us in a room and explained we had to have this procedure done or we would lose him, but there were so many risks to having the procedure done. <laughs> I remember the night we got the text that they didn't think he was going to make it through the night. When you got the text, you just collapse into my arms and just like begin to weep. And I could just feel like, like, we're going to lose. Like, we're going to lose Jack's. Like, we're not going to win this one. There's not going to be victory on this battlefield. Those moments, even though they're really hard, something within us rises up. The only moments of trauma and intensity can actually call forth. In those moments for us, like the only option is like, we just have to worship. I remember standing at this crossroads and this giant of unbelief standing in front of me. Like it's, it's your prayers don't matter. Um, all these prayers don't matter. Like the Lord's not gonna hear it. This is gonna be like the other moments where you prayed with all your heart and then you buried your friend the next week. And, um, and it, but there was like something inside of me of like, no. And the melody just erupted out of my heart that, um, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. He sent me a song, and I don't know to what extent, but he said his, their community had prayed for Jackson, and in a spontaneous moment, they came up with a song, and so they just, you know, recorded it and sent it to me. I took that song over my phone, and I played over my son over and over again. You know, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. And that's exactly what I was doing. I was, I was fighting warfare. And, and it was, wasn't just me, it wasn't alone. I had people <laughs> literally making weapons, writing songs, and sending it to us. It still humbles me and baffles me. The power of global prayer, the power of community, the power of believing together. He started talking again. What did you just paint a picture of? You know, he was, you could tell it was, it was still like fragile, it was still coming back, but he was talking again, and that was like amazing. He was asking in the cutest two year old voice, like everything you can imagine that he liked, you know, I want a hamburger, I want a hamburger, <laughs> you know? But we were so happy to hear him talking again. From talking with Joel, the tone started to feel like, oh wow, we, we're coming out of this, I think. Just the shift internally of like we made it was incredible. We walked in to the hospital just before Christmas and now we're sitting here with a healthy son taking his nap right now. Hey buddy, look, we're going home. <laughs> look, you haven't been outside for a month. I, I remember hearing the news that uh, Jackson is coming home. And it was like, uh, it was like Christmas. We believe in the power of praise. We've seen God do a lot. And I don't know the secret 
to all of it, but I do know that Jackson is well today. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but wonder or think that uh, that that praise had a part of that. This is part of our story now, and it's part of Jackson's testimony of his life that the world will know that miracles happen. This gospel is not haphazard. It's not a Russian roulette. It's not a guessing game. It is the absolute nature of God revealed through his goodness and his kindness. And what is necessary is for the people of God to rise to the occasion, to face the impossibilities of life with the confidence of God's character, his nature, and his promise. There's no other option. We were called to this. This is our responsibility. It is our privilege. So good, amen? Let's all stand. Again, I think we have a moment today to make a choice in our lives that we're not going to leave the same way we came in. Amen? And I think there's some things in some of our lives that we just need to stand and say, God, enough. Like, I, for me, God, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to hear of any more people in our family diagnosed with cancer. I don't want to hear of any more babies that the enemy is pursuing. God, I don't want to hear about any more. God, I just want to just stand in the promises you've spoken over my life. God, I want to stand for marriages of our friends that are being broken. I want to stand for children who are running away from their parents and running away from home. I want to stand, stand upon his word and trust that he is who he says he is that he's faithful, that he's good, that he's sovereign, that his word is true, even when it doesn't line up with what I see. That I'm gonna choose today to say, God, I believe, amen? I believe, God, I'm choosing to rise up and praise. I'm choosing to use the weapons, not of the world, but the weapons of warfare that I know of, God, that I can praise you, God, that I can honor you, that I can lift your name, God, that I can speak to my spirit, man, and say, God, I believe, God, I believe that it didn't just end on the cross, but I believe that you rose from the grave and that you live in me, and so, God, use me, Jesus. Use me to release hope hope and restoration and truth. Use us, God, to be epicenter of revival in this region, Jesus, in this world. Not because we deserve God, not because we've earned it in any way, not because of us, but because of you, God, because of your goodness. God, because you, Holy Spirit, are searching the earth, looking for those who are going to say, God, I give you everything. And I choose to give you my life to use me, God, to bring revival through me, Jesus. Amen? I pray that we'll write songs, that we'll write books, that we'll speak life, that we'll remind this world that he is alive, that he's good, that he's sovereign, and that he created you and I perfectly in his image for a plan and a purpose, and that someday we are going to be standing looking at him face to face where there's going to be no more pain, no more crying, no more tears, no more hurt, but only joy, uncontrollable joy, because we're standing and gazing into the face of our Savior, amen, for eternity. And I want us to not leave this place and say, God, I want, to, I want to know that I know that I know inside of me, Jesus, God, that my life was lived for what matters. So that when I'm dead and gone, that that flame is still being lit because it was for you. Amen? If you guys can, just lift your hands. Amen? Again, just a posture of saying, God, I'm desperate for you, Jesus. God, I say that over us. God, I just pray, God, all of us with our hands raised today, Jesus, God, we just say, we want you, God. I believe, Holy Spirit, that in this moment, Jesus, God, that you are doing what only you can do, God. And so we say, God, we lay everything, all of our faults, all of our past failures, God, all of our insecurities, God, all of our anxiety and our burdens, God, all of our fear, Jesus, God, all of our doubt, all of our unbelief, God, we leave it today at the foot of the cross, Jesus, and we say, God, use us, God, we choose you today, Jesus. 
God, make today be a new day in our lives. God, I pray that years from now, we look back to this day, Jesus, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that today, God, that we build a spiritual altar today, God, that we will remind ourselves every moment of every day for the rest of our lives that our children, that our children's children, God, and their children's children, that they will look back and they will say, what do those stones mean? And we'll say that this moment, this day, this Sunday, when I came, the Lord spoke to me. He reminded me that I am loved. He reminded me that I'm forgiven. He reminded me that he has a plan and a purpose for my life. He reminded me that there's hope in him. He reminded me that there's peace in him. He reminded me that he's sovereign, that he's faithful, and that he's good, and that he's already delivered the city into my hands. And so today is the day, today was the day when I said, Jesus, I choose to believe that and to stand on that no matter what I see, no matter what I feel. And so God, I pray for us, God. I ask in Jesus' name, God, that you consume us, Jesus. God, that there will be nothing left but you, Jesus. God, I pray that as we leave this place, God, that you will fulfill the vision that you gave to me, God, that every single one of us walked out of these doors and we were all separately individual epicenters quaking with reverberation, God, and power and a shaking that only comes from the power of your spirit. God, just restore us, God. Renew us right now, God. Renew our mind. Remind us, God, that it's a new covenant, that it's a new gospel. Renew our mind. God, we break any chain off of us from the enemy, God. Any chain of addiction in Jesus' name. Any chain of oppression in Jesus' name. Any chain of depression in Jesus' name, God. Any chain of fear, of doubt, of unbelief, God, of insecurity, God. And I just speak over us today, Jesus, Holy Spirit, refill us right now, God, with your boldness, God, with your courage, with your strength, with your confidence. God, remind us that we are yours and that we are in your hands, Jesus. So we just say we bless you today. We thank you for all that you are. Hey guys, Pastor Justin here. Thank you so much for tuning into the Bridge Central Coast and for listening to today's message. If you enjoyed this message, take a moment and click the subscribe button on the screen. That way you won't miss a single message in the future. If this message or our ministry has impacted you and you want to partner with us so that we can continue to reach you and others, click on the link below to give now or visit us on the web at www.thebridgecentralcoast.com and give through our website. If you want to come visit us on a Sunday morning, please do so. We meet every single Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at the Napomo High School Forum in Napomo, California. Thanks again for listening, and don't forget to subscribe.